It is my absolute great, great pleasure to introduce David Estrin as our speaker today. Um, David is an exceptionally experienced speaker candidate for our noon panel, and I in person have a particular soft spot for him, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, but first I'll just say a little bit about, about David. He joined CG in September 2014 as a senior research fellow with the International Law Research Program, and at CG he's involved in developing um, and leading examinations of the effectiveness of environmental law regimes, um, including in the area of, of climate change. He's well recognized as Canada's senior environmental law specialist. All kinds of things have happened in Canada in the environmental law realm as a result of David. Um, and I could spend the entire time just talking about his accomplishments. I'll just lay out a couple of recent um, notable uh, international contributions. He is the immediate past chair of the International Bar Association's Environment Committee. And during 2013 to 2014, he was co-chair of the International Bar Association President's Task Force on Climate Change, Justice, and Human Rights. Um, and he will be speaking about that work uh, today. Between 1990 and 2014, David was a partner at Gowling LaFleur Henderson, one of Canada's leading law firms, where he uh, founded and led the Environmental Practice Group. Um, and he's done many, many, many other things, as I say, in the environmental law realm. The soft spot for people who are, mem who are in the International Law S Summer Institute um, relates to the paper of mine that I put on the reading list yesterday, which dated from 1999, the very long um, private international law examination uh, relating to um, what some people might describe as um, extraterritorial environmental liability of transnational corporations. Um, a few years after I had started my own um, law professor career at Western, I received an email from David, who I didn't know, um, who had read that paper and who was asking me to help him to put together a session for an International Bar Association meeting on extraterritorial environmental liability, which we did in Vancouver of that year. Um, as an academic, there is nothing so wonderful as being contacted by someone who's a real leader in the, in the field who's actually read your paper and <laughs> finds it useful. Um, and so with that note, I just want to uh, say a very, very warm welcome to David. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Sarah, it's, uh, it was a pleasure to uh, meet you at that time, and uh, you were absolutely wonderful with your uh, insights, and I really started to learn something about international law from Sarah. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to see that she's now going to be uh, helping us at CG in the International Law Research Program. It's an honor to have been asked to give this lecture and to assist my colleagues, such as Sarah and Neil Craig, Climate change hurts innocent people. It puts ordinary people who, for the most part, have not contribute, contributed in any way to global warming at extraordinary risk. As you've heard, I practiced environmental law for a long time, over 40 years. But it wasn't until I took up my role as uh, co-chair of the uh, IBA Task Force on Climate Change, Justice, and Human Rights three years ago that I learned some fundamental facts why we, you, me, and all of us must urgently limit carbon emissions and do so in a way that achieves and respects climate justice. So here are five fundamental facts and principles I'm going to sort of uh, outline and, and then talk about more detail that I, I learned as part of that experience. As I said at, at the outset, cli climate change is having devastating effects not just on polar bears and ecosystems, but on human life, communities, the very existence of countries and cultures, and indeed impacting global security. Secondly, there is a carbon reduction, imper a carbon reduction imperative. Limits on new and current carbon emissions must be put in place. Third, there is a very limited time window in which we can act to stay within or even close to achieving the two degree C increase that 
we're, we've been advised by the, the experts we, we must try and achieve. Fourth thing is, in all of this activity to deal with climate change, we must take into account climate justice, both in mitigation measures as well as adaptation measures. And uh, that becomes important. Mitigation by mitigation, I mean efforts to stop emissions. Adaptation, I'm, uh, by that I mean efforts to deal with things that are going to happen regardless of all the efforts we can make to stop it. Fifthly, we need to recognize that our current legal systems at international and national levels are, to say the least, unhelpful in terms of mitigating climate change or providing justice in adaptation measures. Reforms are required, and that was one of the major tasks that we undertook as part of the IBA report, and it report has about 50 measures recommended. I'll be telling you about some of these at the end of my presentation. Let me move then first to the first aspect, how and what in what respect climate change is having drastic effects on communities and cultures. When it comes to uh, human suffering, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, doesn't mince its words. According to its latest report, climate change is on its way to, quote, causing severe, pervasive, and irreversible damage on the world's peoples, cultures, ecos ecosystems, and economies. You know, the risk is not just a matter of extreme weather events, even, uh, you know, even tragic as they, may, such, as they may be, such as, say, the heat wave in Russia that took 55,000 lives in 2010, or uh, Typhoon Haiyan recording the fastest wind speeds on record. It's also the intensifying effect climate change has on intractable global problems, such as war, famine, and economic migration. As some of you may well understand, repeated hot summers contributed to a spike in droughts in Syria, triggering hardship and riots that culminated in the vicious civil war now underway. And if you want to talk more about uh, global uh, insecurity caused by climate change, talk with Simon Dalby, who's with, with CG. On the most recent World Human Rights Day, December 10th, 2014, when some, of, when some of us here perhaps were in Lima for the COP20, all of the human all of the UN human rights special mandate holders, these are the special rapporteurs on the right to food, for example, or John Knox, the independent expert on the relationship between human rights and the environment, came together to issue a joint statement on climate change and human rights. And just let me quote it. It said, climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our generation with consequences that transform life on earth and adversely impact the livelihood of many people. It poses great risks and threats to the environment, human health, accessibility and inclusion, access to water, sanitation and food, security and economic and social development. These impacts of climate change interfere with the effective enjoyment of human rights. In particular, climate change has a disproportionate effect on many disadvantaged, marginalized, excluded and vulnerable individuals and groups including those whose way of life are instricably linked to the environment. Pretty concise but powerful statement. Second thing I want to talk about, and I learned that about the carbon reduction imperative, and we're going to start getting into the, the visual and maybe audio stuff in a minute. There is this carbon reduction imperative. Limits on new and carbon uh, emissions must be put in place. Now, last year, the IPCC uh, said that if we are to stabilize warming at 2 degrees C, as the international communities agreed in 2009, we must achieve zero net emissions of greenhouse gases be before 20 2011. Yeah, I can't read these things, but I think that's what it says. Um, and, and they predict that without additional mitigation, the planet will experience temperature increases 3.7 to 4.8 C above pre-industrialized levels. And the World Bank and the Potsdam Institute describe that kind of an increase as absolutely uh, devastating. If we don't act, make, get our governments to act, and, and it's all part of us to get governments to act, we're in for a scenario so horrific. Our children and our grandchildren will be asking each of us, where were we when you let this happen to us, to our beautiful planet, and its oceans, glaciers, and animals, and vast numbers of people who are losing their homelands, disappearing, or becoming climate refugees. 
What are some of these devastating events and impacts? Let's see if I can make this. Easy. As I said uh, further, there's no certainty that anybody can adapt to 4 degrees C. It's likely to be highly, highly disruptive. The, um, the IPCC said uh, um, it will result in things like inundation of coastal cities, increasing risk for food production, potentially leading to higher malnutrition, many dry regions becoming drier and wet regions wetter, unprecedented heat waves in many regions, especially in the tropics, substantially exacerbated water scarcity in many regions, hey, California, increased frequency of high-intensity tropical cyclones, and an irreversible loss of biodiversity. Yet these are only the predictable consequences of anthropogenic climate change. Even more alarmingly, a four degree C warmer world confronts us with risks and dangers that are new and unknown, and for which we are entirely unprepared. Large areas of the tropics would become essentially uninhabitable, for example. But even if we were to succeed in limiting the increase in global temperatures to the ambitious and international goal of two degrees C, a feat whose achievement is far from certain, the consequences would still be devastating for some, for example, those living in low-lying cities, small island states, and the Arctic regions, for example. Should we fail to alter our course soon, not only will prosperity be denied to hundreds of millions of people worldwide, but decades of efforts at sustainable develop in the developed world would be vitiated by unprecedented strains on resources. And some of what I'm saying is from our report, the IBA report. The third critical thing I learned that is that there is a very limited time window in which we can act to stay within or even close to limiting temperature rise to 2 degree C. Let's look at the next slide. The scientists have told us if we want to try and stay within 2 degrees C, we have to cap emissions at 1 trillion tonnes or below a concentration of 450 ppm. And some people have said a cap of 600 billion tonnes is necessary to more securely safeguard uh, the climate. Where are we now? Well, as of June last year, we're almost at 600 billion. At current rates, the trillionth ton would be emitted in December 2040. So, what do we do? Well, one thing we can examine is what must be done with carbon sources still in the ground. At least 66% of proven reserves must remain embedded in place. Even the International Energy Agency, set up by you know, uh, various countries in Europe and elsewhere, agree. They've said 66 of proven reserves must remain embedded in place to, re to meet the 2 degrees C target. Others estimate 80% of reserves must be unexploited to achieve safe levels of warning. These findings not only unequivocally establish the scientific foundations for recognizing that climate change has already begun to seriously harm human society, they also you know, underline the immediate need for a new approach to limit carbon emissions through all possible means, including legislation and other legal means, and even litigation. Not that any of that is the only solution, but as a lawyer, I will speak about it. Uh, let's next turn to how climate change will, in fact, impact on human rights in more detail and why there is a need for climate justice. Here are the list of human rights that climate change has begun to impact and will increasingly impact. The right to life, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, the right to adequate food, the right to water and sanitation, to adequate housing, to self-determination, to, to the rights of those particularly vulnerable, including women, children, persons with disabilities, those living in poverty, indigenous people, and displaced persons. This is, that list is taken from a, a recent 20, uh, April 20th, uh, 2015 Human Rights Council special report, which you can find on the internet. Let me elaborate on this a, a minute from, the, from our own IBA report. We, we can put, you know, so I've listed off, you know, A to G, rights that will be impacted. These are internationally recognized human rights. They can be subsumed perhaps under three broader categories, the right to life, the right to health, and the right to subsistence. As cities and nations are threatened, and, and there's other rights besides those individuals, I mean, you're going to be threatening cities with flooding, et cetera. 
they're going to lose uh, they're going to lose territory. They're going to have civil and political rights that will be impacted. The international community may soon be faced with the problem of people potentially be, being rendered stateless when their territory vanishes under the rising ocean. You're going to hear from Mohammed Nasheed, the former president of the Maldive Islands. I mean, he says their country is going to disappear. <clears throat> In, since 2005, when the Inuit people petitioned the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to recognize damage to their human rights caused by climate change, and with the 2007 Malay Declaration on Human Dimensions of Global Climate Change, since those two things, the international community has seen a growing number of calls for recognition of the profound links between climate change and human rights. And, you know, the right to life was recognized in the 1976 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and I've already given you some examples of how those rights can be impacted by climate change. Uh, let me turn to the right to the highest attainable standard of health which has been part of the discourse on international human rights law since 1946. That's equally impacted by, uh, implicated by the impact of climate change. The damage to agriculture and the accompanying decline in food security are far from the only threat. Climate change will result in increased exposure to countless illnesses, from cardiovascular disease to psychological harm created by destabilization or displacement. Numerous vector-borne diseases are temperature sensitive. Hey, we're going to have all those nice American insects up here soon, and even those from South America, perhaps. And changes or increase in migration patterns of both animals and people can accelerate the spread of disease, Lyme disease, for example, and reintroduce previously eradicated illnesses into new parts of the world. Additionally, where uh, food, basic foodstuffs are traded as commodities on the global market, scarcities and shocks due to climate change will have knock-on effects in the form of price spikes, potentially making staples unaffordable for many in the developing world, as happened in the food crisis of 2008. And some of these things I'm talking about are from our, the IBA report. The next one is threats to subsistence due to displacement. As climate change contributes to forced human migration and displacement, the resulting crisis will create threats not only to health, but also to subsistence. In 2009, there was a report out of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees which said that gradual and sudden environmental changes are already resulting in substantial human migration and displacement. And they came up with a statement which some people dispute, but they say, this trend is expected to continue with anywhere between 50 million and 200 million people moving as a result by the middle of the century, either within their countries or across borders on a permanent or temporary basis. Well, we've already seen internal displacement starting to happen from events like Hurricane Katrina, or her typhoon, typhoon Haiyan. <clears throat> and to make matters worse, displaced individuals often come from vulnerable social groups, and their displacement creates additional hardships and threats to their basic human rights. And that internal displacement creates other concerns because it can undermine basic needs like housing, access to public services, and security. Let's talk about the impact on communities and cultures, which, you know, the free enjoyment of cultural and minority rights. Cultural rights are especially threatened where the population at issue has developed around a close relationship to the natural world. Think of indigenous people, for example. As climate change forces cultures to adapt to a changing environment rather than respect their long-standing tradition or norms, important parts of groups historical and cultural background will be lost. Minority rights will also be harmed by climate change in the process of equalizing outcomes for women and minorities in developing countries will be set back considerably. Women are caretakers in many developing countries and they, have, they face increased health risks and have higher mortality rates in the aftermath of natural disasters. Children face stunted growth in health problems due to mal malnutrition or forced migra migrant status. And then there's the effects on states. I've already talked, alluded to them. I mean, states are going to essentially disappear, some of them. They're going to certainly have disappearing land, even Florida. This poses unprecedented questions about the nature of citizenship and raises thorny issues to, as to how the world will respond to future dis forced displacement and migration. 
Let me turn now for a minute to international law as a backdrop to some of this, and you're going to be learning more about this in your course. But I just want to talk for a minute about the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, and Kyoto Protocol, just for a minute. So there's a relatively small body of international law directly dealing with climate change, and the two specific regimes are, as I said, the UNFCC, which is a framework convention, doesn't require anybody to do anything, but it's a framework, and it's implementing mechanism, the Kyoto Protocol. In addition, there's uh, customary international law and general principles of law relevant to the governance of climate change-related actions and policies, and I hope you'll be talking more about that in, in the course that you're taking this week. So the UNFCC, the Framework Convention, the main international treaty, calls for, quote, stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, unquote. It entered into force in 1994 and provides a framework and forum for negotiation on actions. Well, that negotiation and meetings have been happening for 20 years, and we're into the 21st year, and I'm going tonight to uh, uh, a lead-up session that's getting ready for the 21st one in Paris. The one I'm going to is in Bonn. Well, there's a lot of talk, but in the meantime, over the last 20 years, unfortunately, greenhouse gas emissions have just continued to escalate. While the UNFCC boasts universal membership with 196 parties, and the world's states have signed and signaled the importance and legitimacy of addressing human rights in the context of climate change. Unfortunately, as I said, not much has happened effectively. Now, it doesn't mean to say that the UN process is irrelevant. It just means that there's got to be other things happening to kick it into gear and, and kick, kick bottom so that we actually get something achieved. Um, now, in 2010, at the Cancun uh, COP, state parties emphasized that parties should, in all climate change-related actions fully respect human rights. And in 1997, the international community negotiated the Kyoto Protocol, which sets binding obligations on most developed countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It entered into force in 2005 with 191 parties plus the EU. The U.S. was not one of those parties, as it did not ratify the protocol. And under the protocol, parties agreed to emission limitations and reductions in two commitment periods, first applying to emissions between 2008 and 2012, and the second to emissions between 2013 and 2020. The protocol was amended in 2012 to accommodate the second commitment period, but the amendment has not yet entered into force. And in 2012, our Prime Minister repudiated the Kyoto Protocol and had Canada withdraw from it. While Japan and Russia said they would not accept new Kyoto commitments, Canada is distinguished as the only country to withdraw and repudiate it. So I'm, when I go to these international meetings, I say, well, I'm from Canada, but here, I've got something I think useful to say, <laughs> regardless. So, so what's going to be happening this year? Well, states are now hoping to achieve a global agreement on mitigation and adaption at the, at the, in Paris in, 20, in December. But I wouldn't hold my uh, uh, place too long in thinking that it's going to happen in, in all respects. So that's just a bit of backdrop on, on that process. Uh, let me just say a couple more words before uh, about climate, the importance of climate change justice. And, and you say, well, what is that? I mean, as you can, from what I've said, this climate change injustice is felt across generations because the cumulative environmental effects of human behavior can last centuries, even millennia. <clears throat> Future institutions and individuals, our children, uh, grandchildren, will have to grapple with the consequences of present day choices. <clears throat> Action is needed today to prevent climate change from intensifying. The need for climate change justice is also apparent in the unequal ge geographic distribution of its environmental effects. Unlike the kind of pollution that we're more used to, which has more localized effects, even the, even the stuff that went up used to go up the Sudbury super stack and went into Quebec, at least you know where it was going. But um, unlike more localized forms of pollution, when CO2 goes up into the atmosphere, it stays up there and it circulates all around the world and for 100 or 200 years. So the externalities of climate change are not confined to neighboring countries and region, but affect the entire world. 
International norms and law, including the so-called no harm rule, already recognize that individual countries may not cause environmental harm in areas beyond the limits of their national jurisdiction, but climate change raises the same concern on a global scale. Thus, the most equitable conception of climate change must recognize that while the developed nations have contributed the most to climate change over the past two centuries, it's the developing nations and their people who stand to suffer the most extreme consequences. For example, from 1970 to 2008, over 95 percent of deaths due to natural disasters took place in the developing world. <clears throat> and quite simply, when they negotiated the UN uh, framework agreement, they recognized that rich nations are in a better position to do things, and so they had uh, concepts that, that I'll talk about in a minute. Poor countries simply don't have the abilities, in many cases, to do anything about these pernicious effects. So climate justice as a concept allows us to view climate change and efforts to combat it as having ethical implications and to consider how these should relate to wider justice concerns. Practically speaking, this means not just thinking of the political and moral issues, but rather thinking of how we can bring justice in, avo in, avoid, in avoiding the worsening of climate change by continuing to emit enormous quantities of greenhouse gases, how we can avoid hindering development of poorer nations in the methods that we find to reduce those emissions, and in adaptation methods. I was shocked when I went to Lima in December and heard directly from people from some South American countries who were having projects built by, under the clean development mechanism, which is one of the things that comes under the UN climate change agreement uh, framework agreement, fund set up by the international community, and supposedly going to build uh, projects that would not emit uh, C, uh, GHG into the atmosphere as much, dams, for example. Well, when they go to build dams, they could, if they're not thinking about it carefully and, and, and sensitively, they could actually end up flooding out a whole communities of indigenous people. And then their potential conflicts and the people protest and their local governments say, go away. If, if, and, 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 then, and so then there's protests. And what happens? The, these companies often use pe people in the communities uh, or other people, and, they get, and the people who protest get killed. I mean, human rights in South America impacted by climate change are a hell of a lot different than anything we can think of being impacted by human rights in Canada or the United States. People literally on the way to the COP conference in Lima were, were killed and dismembered. Not just from dams, from mining projects, things like that, all of which had some of this financing. In the past few decades, these justice and equity concerns have found expression in international agreements to some extent. For example, in 1992, the Rio Earth Summit embraced the precautionary principle. And with respect to equity obligations, the, even the Framework Convention endorsed a principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, where the, whereby obligations are supposedly taken on by the developed countries uh, and leaving uh, the developing countries not to necessarily have the same commitments. That's going to be changed by the Paris Agreement. And then there's this no harm rule which is mentioned in the UNFCC, it notes that states have, in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations and the principle of international law, the responsibility to ensure that activities within their jurisdiction and control do not cause damage to the environment of other states or of areas beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. However, these justice principles, while incorporated into, into the international system nominally, are not dominant as guiding principles and in climate change policy making, nor have they been particularly effective. So for example, in, in last year, the International Law Association put out draft articles on climate change in which they recognized some of these issues and they articulated things that should be done. I don't think I'll have time to, I'll just refer to them, one of them, for example. Uh, draft Article 4 on equity esta would establish that states shall protect the climate system in a manner that equitably balances the needs of present and future generations of mankind, recognizing both present and future generations. International, in, intergenerational equity is an important element of climate change justice, and that was recognized by Ban Ki-moon in his report on last year. Climate justice by necessity incorporates intergenerational equity for reasons that you can anticipate. We're talking about the rights of the unborn, 
So taking all of these things into account, our task force um, came up with a uh, context of looking at what could be done in the context of human rights. We thought, for, for our purposes, that it would be appropriate to say that um, what we are striving to achieve is to ensure communities, individuals, and governments have substantive legal and procedural rights to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, and the means to take or cause measures to be taken at regional and international levels to mitigate sources of climate change and provide for adaptation in a manner that respects human rights. I'm just going to refer to one other uh, development that's happened in the last, in March, there's something called the Oslo Principles. And um, March the 1st, a group of experts in international law, human rights, environmental law, and others adopted these principles on global obligations to reduce climate change. These experts came from uh, universities, national and international courts, and organizations around the world. And they identified obligations of states and enterprises to take specific forms of action, including to limit temperature increases. I'll just outline a few of them very briefly. They said it's, it's necessary for states to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, refrain from starting new activities that cause excessive GHG emissions, bring about lawful and, appro and appropriate trade consequences for states failing to comply with the obligations, refrain from providing new subsidies, aid, et cetera, for the installation of major new facilities that will have GHG emissions, et cetera. And they said that neither the high cost nor the lack of financial means can alone excuse a state's failure to meet its obligations to achieve reductions or constitute a defense against legal sanctions that may be imposed as a consequence of such a failure. A couple of people signing on to that were uh, Antonio Benjamin from the High Court of Brazil, Michael Gerard, who's the director of the Climate Change Center at the Sabin Center in, at Columbia University, some other judges as well. And they also identified a number of procedural principles that I don't have time to get into. So how did I get into all of this? And this is my immediate prelude to a little bit of, of seeing uh, uh, some, some, uh, an interesting eight-minute film clip. I got into this because Mary Robinson, who is now Ban Ki-moon's climate on, special climate change envoy, and who was then and former president, also former president of Ireland, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and also has her own Human Rights Foundation dealing with climate change. She, in 2013, in Dublin, challenged the IBA, which was meeting in Dublin, which is the IBA being the world's largest organization of international lawyers, judges, and law societies, to take up the challenge of identifying what laws, institutions, and related world organizations, such as the UN or the WTO, could do to help those who would be most affected. She said, climate change justice means sharing responsibility. Those most responsible must take the lead and show greatest ambition in their domestic climate actions and support for, for vulnerable communities. Well, the IBA took up the challenge. I was asked uh, by the president to uh, lead a task force together with my other co-chair was Baroness Helena Kennedy, QC, a leading British barrister, a member of the House of Lords, a very uh, uh, well-known advocate for human rights. Uh, she's also the co-chair of the International Bar Association Human Rights Institute. The task force was comprised of leading academics, judges, and practitioners. It also had commercial corporate lawyers, such as the former counsel for Dutch, Royal Dutch Shell, the secretary general of the Swedish Bar Association, and the former general counsel of the US EPA. So it wasn't just a bunch of greenies on this thing. And the IBA is certainly not a, a green organization. You can imagine uh, creeping off to different places around the world for very expensive meetings, uh, you have to have some uh, clients. Uh, anyway, in 2014, our report came out. We looked at a vast range of areas, including uh, human rights treaties, uh, human rights commissions, investment law, world trade law. And our report is a report, 240 pages long, and it's got over 800 endnotes. It's, it's pretty comprehensive. You can find it online. It's available. Just Google IBA Climate Justice Report. You'll find it. Anyway, in each case, we found that these legal systems provided weak or non-existent capacities to effectively mitigate climate change, or provide justice to those affected. And, but as I said, we didn't just leave it at problems. We identified a whole bunch of solutions. I won't have time to really talk about them in any detail. At the front of the report, in Chapter 1, there is an, a, a, there's a, the executive summary is very good. And at the end of the executive summary, there's an action matrix, which lists a whole bunch of measures, over 50, that we identified that could be taken by various states, by international bodies, et cetera. Before I go further, let me show you then a brief clip for the, from, from the IBA Tokyo meeting. 
where this report was presented, you're going to see some strong remarks about actions required from world leaders, including Al Gore, Mary Robinson, former Maldives Island President Mohamed Nasheed, and Felipe Calderon, the former President of Mexico. And if you could come up and give me a hand at this point, that would be terrific. Because you are the voice of the global legal profession, you do have an extraordinary and rare opportunity to help chart the course forward toward a sustainable and just and survivable future. Our continued reliance on dirty fossil fuels is clearly unsustainable and unjust. We are paying the cost of carbon every hour of every day. We must internalize that cost into our market system. We need to put a price on carbon in markets, and we need to put a price on denial in politics. Fossil fuels are still receiving from governments around the world annual subsidies that are 25 times larger than the meager subsidies that are given to renewable energy as we try to speed up this transition. Those subsidies for dirty energy must be halted. The way forward is toward clean, sustainable, renewable energy that's already available and is spreading rapidly. As a lawyer myself, I have felt for quite some time that the legal profession worldwide has been behind the curve on the negative impacts of climate change. It already poses huge challenges to human rights, to food and health in vulnerable countries. And we face the prospect of millions of climate displaced people who are not recognized as refugees and for whom there is as yet no international convention. The significance of this report lies firstly in its assessment that current law is inadequate to meet the challenges of climate change. As a result, the legal profession has a critical role to play in strengthening and creating the laws, norms, regulations and policies needed to ensure an effective and equitable response to, cl to climate change. We cannot solve the climate crisis without you, the lawyers of the world. The report is also significant for its legal treatment of the impacts of climate change on human rights and the proposal of practical ways of using and strengthening legal frameworks and human rights law to ensure climate justice. What this report shows is that climate change is an issue of justice with repercussions for all aspects of law, from corporate law to litigation, human rights law to trade law. Whether you work to protect the interests of business, citizens or states, climate change is part of your portfolio. It is not correct to say that taking action on climate change, being responsible with the environment and the future of children, of our children and grandchildren will hurt economic growth. It is possible to have economic growth and tackling climate change at the same time. Yes, we need to choose right now a different path of growth, but it is possible to get jobs and economic growth being responsible. If we are going to invest, we are estimating $90 trillion in 15 years, either in urban development, energy or land uses. Let's do the right way not in high carbon economies, but in low carbon economies, that is possible. What do we do in a nation like Australia where due to party political reasons, some really good policy on carbon pricing is undone by a following government? You know, we from the uh, British uh, civil uh, common law tradition uh, uh, have a problem. Uh, we don't have a constitution that actually talks about the environment and the right to have a safe, clean, healthy environment. 95, 100 countries in the world do. Those who got their constitution, if you like, uh, written as it may, unwritten as it largely may be in some cases from the British mold are the uh, lesser off. 
uh, when you, you see effectively that citizens are able to go to, con to courts in Chile, in, in Africa, uh, in Europe even, and, and say, we have a right to a safe, clean, healthy environment, and that policy is contradictory. So I think we have to work in these former Commonwealth countries to at least get the same level of legal protection. Every week brings more evidence that climate change is already changing lives. The drumbeat is growing stronger, but so is the granting sound of dissent from mouthpieces of polluting economy. The legal profession will play a key role in driving climate policy. By drawing attention to specific con consequences of inaction, you can make the real implication of climate change a little more real. The law is, as, as you know, a living thing. Its evolution reflects the forces changing society. From human rights to equal opportunity, but the legal fraternity itself can also shape these forces. The inundation of the Maldives is just a generation away. When I was elected president, I caused some controversy by saying we would someday have to leave our islands. I was hopeful then that we would be able to change the way our story ends. But I fear it's too late for the Maldives. If current trends continue, Maldives will be among the first climate refugees. We will face issues of citizenship, sovereignty, and repatriation. If our nation sinks, we will be forced to answer questions more familiar to Palestinians, Rohingyas, and the Kurds. I fear that these questions will be answered one day, not in the abstract, but in a court of law. And I fear that we, the people of the Maldives, will be, will be the star witness. So we look to the international community to provide legal protection where it could not provide environmental protection. Ladies and gentlemen, it may be too late to save homelands in Kiribati, Tuvalu, or the Maldives. It may be too late to save the species which depends on stable temperature, clean air, or pleasant seas. But it is not too late to change our ways. It is very much a plan, indeed a first priority of uh, my upcoming presidency of the IBA for the two years of 2015 and 2016 uh, to continue the work of this task force. Uh, most importantly, there are many recommendations uh, aimed at the United Nations uh, and asking the United Nations to take various steps. Uh, and we look forward to working with President Robinson on those recommendations and finding the best way uh, to uh, work with UN uh, members and to uh, 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 ensure to do what we can that the UN will take these recommendations seriously and follow up. Uh, we look forward to the assistance of all of you. Uh, I, I, I can promise you that the IBA will be the global voice in the legal profession on this issue. Thank you. As you can see from the film, the challenges are huge and time is short. But there are some factors which provide some optimism. I mean, I've been pretty gloomy, I think. But uh, on the legal front, indeed, I think there's some new legal imperatives. I'm going to try and finish up in the next seven or eight minutes, so there's still time. And I understand for the people who are in the class that you're not, your, your next event's at 2, so we'll probably, depending on the questions, be able to go to 1.30 or a little bit after. Uh, so, on the legal front, there are some new legal imperatives for states, state agencies, corporations, and financial institutions to act. So, for example, uh, in uh, 2013, John Knox, who is uh, an international law professor who uh, was appointed UN independent expert on human rights and the environment, did a big study and he found states have obligations to protect against environmental harm that interfere with the enjoyment of human rights. And he also found that states have, A, obligations to adopt and implement legal frameworks to protect against environmental harm that may infringe on enjoyment of human rights, and B, to regulate private actors to protect against such environmental harms. Now you say, well, okay, that's nice, but how does this get operationalized? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, and um, when you start thinking about it from a legal perspective at a national level, 
uh, it, it, it would be very difficult in Canada because we don't have any constitutional rights to be protected from a nasty environment or, or other things like that. But we do have a right to life in our Constitution. It's in Section 7. And um, as I'm going to explain to you a little bit later, some courts have said right to life should include freedom from serious environmental consequences. And uh, so statements like this, findings like this, could help if someone in the future were to think about a court case in Canada as to why Canada's non-action on climate change or limited action on climate change is, is in fact uh, violating these kinds of principles. Um, well, we also had before John Knox's report, as some of you know, uh, the 2011 UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, the Ruggie Principles. And uh, y y many of you are familiar with these about business enterprises should respect human rights. This means they should avoid infringing on human rights. And, and also they have responsibilities to avoid causing or contributing to these impacts through their own activities and seek to prevent these through their operations, products, or services by the business, by business relationships, even if they haven't contributed, and there's many other principles. So um, it seems to me with Knox's report, which followed Ruggie, I think we have Ruggie Plus, a basis for voluntary and, if necessary, state-imposed carbon budget requirements. This will or should drive political action as well as business and financial investment decisions and corporate conduct. And we can see that this is starting to happen at, an, at some in the, in the higher levels of many corporations and, and international financial institutions. But there is clearly increasing necessity for corporations, investors, and lenders to limit and decrease their carbon footprint. Why? Well, because other trains are coming down the track for them. Carbon reframed as a toxic substance. If you have a need for a carbon limit, which is undisputed, if there's a human right to a healthy environment, then we've got to do something about carbon. And if we don't, carbon is going to be regarded as a toxic substance. And carbon reserves may be regarded, therefore, need to be seen to be remain embedded in place, except under conditions of assuring that there's no new greenhouse gas emissions during extraction or use, and or limited exemptions for communities that need some access to, to this type of resource, the, the justice perspective. Why would this happen? Well, it will happen, I think, unless the oil and coal industries react more helpfully and differently than the tobacco industry did when tobacco was revealed to be a major health threat. On the left, ads. <coughs> More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Most of you are too young to have seen that kind of an ad. But that's what they used to advertise. And they had doctors supposedly willing to pose in those advertisements. Well, 40 years later, we're not exactly in the same place. And even we started running the ads on the right 40 years ago in Canada. Will carbon extractors and producers recognize that they should help pay for some portion of the public cost to respond to the impacts of past emissions, for example? Will they respond to the fact that their previous emissions are helping to require municipalities to spend money that they never anticipated to replace sewers that are now too small, roads that are being flooded? Um, will they contribute to the public expense of shifting to renewable energy? If they do so voluntarily and with a sense of responsibility, that's one good thing. If they do not, they will likely be forced to do so by changing public opinion. So instead of ad advertising the gasoline is the best thing your car ever had, you're going to get stickers on gas pumps saying, use of this fuel product contributes to climate change, which may put up to 30% of species at a likely risk of extinction. This is a campaign that's now going on in Canada, whereby municipalities can pass bylaws requiring these labels on, on gas pumps. So can a simple sticker help us to act on climate change? Possibly they can. And you know what? People are really changing their attitudes. This is, a, this is yes, uh, May, two days ago, Portland propane gas plant halted by environmental protests. A story out of the big story in the business section of the Globe and Mail. And the headline read, or the subheading read, the project's most vocal opponents base their opposition not only on the perceived faults of the project itself, but primarily as part of an overarching stance against the very concept of building more fossil fuel infrastructure. 
and despite it being a big company, Pembina, uh, Pembina uh, and, and being welcomed initially in the community, they were told to get out of town and basically they, they accepted the message. The example of tobacco companies being sued by virtually all U.S. states to repay public health care costs for smokers and to help people quit smoking is a precedent for how and why carbon is more likely going to become regarded as a toxic substance. There was a statement in the 2013 uh, Global Risks of the World Economic Forum, the Davos Forum, that recognized, quote, five decades ago the U.S. tobacco industry would not have suspected that in 1997 it would agree to pay $368 billion in health-related damages. And two days ago, a Quebec court awarded $15 billion in damages to a class of smokers in Quebec. Who, so, and then we have carbon divestiture campaigns at universities and, by, uh, at, and uh, some investment funds. They're also indicative of this train coming down the track. There's also substantive discussions and investigations as to whether carbon reserves should be regarded as stranded assets. The Bank of England, for example, has got such an inquiry underway. And and, and as to whether or not, for example, the, the so-called uh, plus side of the balance sheet of Shell and BP are really uh, pluses or maybe should be regarded uh, as minus. And then there's other things happening. Carbon majors will be targeted. What am I talking about? Well, there was a study that came out about three years ago by uh, Heed and others which tracked 63% of CO2 and methane emitted between seven, the year 1751 and 2010 to just 90 emitters, states and their corporate permittees. There was a recent meeting in Toronto where possible class action for, on, by municipalities to recover their increased infrastructure costs uh, with the carbon majors being potential defendants was being talked about. And, um, and they were, and the, really the thought was, we'll invite you to help us out, and if you don't want to do so voluntarily, we might just help you do it involuntarily through a statement of claim. So, I mean, litigation can be a, a spur to these things, and I want to talk about that by, in, in sort of concluding. Uh, in some countries, as you've heard, there are constitutional rights being asserted by citizens. In some countries, legal reforms are being examined. I mean, 92% of countries recognize the right to a healthy environment, and about 95 countries around the world have such a right. When I was in Lima, there was a special session of the uh, Lima Constitutional Court where they had judges not only from Peru but from Brazil and a few other countries, and they were talking about biodiversity in the face of climate change. And it was amazing. Here it was in the highest court in this country, and they were having a session about how we can't wait for the United Nations process. It's taken 20 years, and we're not convinced it's going to do very, anything very soon very effectively. Court is one way to try and help out. They see litigation as the necessary path forward. Well, the IBA, as a follow-up to last year's report, is going to be um, working on legal reforms. Um, one of the things I'm going to be doing is heading up a, a, a working group or coordinating a working group on drafting a climate change remedy statute, working with some senior judges and, and lawyers from around the world. So let me talk for a minute about Canada's constitution. As I mentioned, we don't have anything specifically in our, in our environment. In our, in, in our constitution about the environment, but we do have in section seven, the right to life and the right to security of the person and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Well, there is a case going forward in the Ontario courts about people in Sarnia living beside a, a petrochemical complex. Uh, these are First Nations community who are perceived to have much different negative health outcomes than others. The Supreme Court of India has found that there is a right to healthful environment within the notion of a right to life. And the Supreme Court of India has used this to tighten vehicle emission standards and ordered a municipality to replace its diesel fleet with a uh, CNG fleet. And they've also taken other steps. So with all of these, you know, possibilities of, of uh, our, uh, one of the things our task force, our working group is going to do is look at ways in which barriers to successful uh, litigation can be eliminated. For example, there's standing issues, there's causality issues, there's uh, damages issues. We're going to look at some of those things. So if you put all those things together, the important new international reports heighten corporate re social responsibility, the need to achieve a global carbon cap, constitutionalization of environmental rights, concerned public activism, all of these things I think are 
helping to drive stuff forward. And um, I think, um, and I'm going to spend two more minutes just to finish up then on what did the, what have we actually recommended beyond that which I've said. Um, this is the cover of the report. So um, let me, um, for, I'm just going to highlight five different things very quickly. One of the things we, types of things we recommended is facilitate actions in the court, which some people regard as the third branch of government. I mentioned the Indian example. And uh, we're going to, as I say, do that. Um, that could be, once this model uh, statute comes out, it could be used by nations, by sub subnationals, and it could be used at an international level as well. Uh, second thing we, rec we recommended was reinforce human rights and um, make, in other words, green human rights. The human rights regime hasn't so far had, really had to deal with human rights impacted by climate change. Uh, there was an attempt to do that in the Inuit case. Uh, didn't get too far. Uh, but John Knox has recommended that this whole process be greened, if you like, urging human rights bodies to consider not only impacts of environmental degradation, but climate change specific impacts on human rights. And that the UN Commissioner on Human Rights draft report outlining a minimum core of rights and duties implicated by the right to a healthy environment, particularly as it pertains to climate change. And that, uh, as we said, further clarify and green the scope of human rights obligations. And that the Office of the Human Rights Commissioner develop a model internal corporate policy which would help commit corporations to take a number of concrete steps designed to prevent or mitigate climate change impacts linked to human rights. And that leads to the third area we made a number of recommendations in respect of greater involvement of the corporate and financial sectors. Um, and uh, so we, you know, just so we think that uh, uh, we recommended that the UN framework on corporate responsibility, the Ruggie principles, should be uh, enlarged to specifically recognize that the actions that corporations can, can implement to assist in achieving a two degree C objective, to, that companies should be required to think about, if not use, the most advanced available technology. And where negative impact on the environment is unavoidable, take steps to implement corresponding mitigation and remediation. And there's a number of other things. Um, we also recommend uh, things, made recommendations to states. Um, clarification of human rights obligations related to climate change. Look at our model statute on remedies when it comes out. Um, states should recognize that they have these substantive obligations, as John Knox pointed out, to adopt legal and institutional frameworks. And uh, we encourage states and international organizations and consultation with corporations to develop and subsequently adopt clear and implementable objective standards for corporate reporting in respect of human rights issues pertaining to the environment. And et cetera. So. Then we also looked at the World Trade Organization and getting the trade system right. And obviously, if any of you looked at that, there's a whole number of things that can be done there. We have some very specific recommendations. So let me conclude. Um, all of us are, as citizens, are aware, no, let me start back again. All of us, as aware citizens, can help identify, implement, or at least appreciate the need for some new legal approaches, both legal and non legal. Legal, well, we could try and do something in respect of getting past emitters who are still around to help contribute to uh, rectifying some of the damage. And it doesn't have to be a lawsuit. It could be innovative things like uh, a, a no-fault uh, scheme, something like the Ship Source Oil Pollution Fund to help pay for climate change loss and damage. Or it could be not through law, but using our, and I say our, high level of awareness, we can help our family and friends in carbon-based industries and even at political levels to appreciate that there is a need to change and that uh, we have to make them understand why there's a need to change rapidly into uh, alternative forms of energy and energy delivery systems. As Mary Robinson said in a recent article, uh, 
The backing for climate justice is pivotal from the IBA, but we cannot leave climate justice to the lawyers. Climate justice is about all of us. It's about acknowledging our personal responsibility in an interconnected world. It's about acting outside the narrow confines of self-interest, even as it becomes clear that our self-interest can destroy the lives of our own children and grandchildren. She said, the IBA report is not the last word on climate justice, but it's an important and credible voice. It's a clarion call and a sign that the word is spreading. The only solutions to climate change are fair solutions that protect human rights and uphold the rule of law. I hope you'll all contribute to that and thank you for listening and I'll be able to available for questions. Uh, thank you very much for that talk um, and presentation. Uh, I was just wondering that just kind of on about the beginning of your presentation and the dire music in the video is that this is a, a truly cataclysmic and catastrophic, catastrophic situation and that may warrant emergency measures. Not at this point, I was just wondering what role would let's say the United Nations Security Council and passing something like uh, Resolution 1373 after terrorism, or later on, 1320, uh, earlier on, 1325 about gendered violence. Uh, has the Bar Association ever looked at at what point it warrants some sort of security exceptional law? Well, we haven't looked directly at what the Security Council could or should do. I mean. I mean, there's a certain amount of real politic that has to be appreciated, as you're quite aware, of course. Nothing happens to the Security Council unless it's, if it's going to be vetoed, and the permanent members all have a veto. And we're talking about, always in the context of international law and international agreements, self-interest and what people think and countries think are in their self-interest, and that's been the problem up till now. I mean, it's an extremely, uh, I mean, the UN, the whole UNFCC process is, is really, hard to take for someone like myself who, as a lawyer, wants to get something done and laws clear and enforced. I went to Lima and, you know, you had a, a text up on a screen for negotiating purposes and people would argue for days about whether this word should be in the body of the text or in the preamble and, and you know, it, it, so th that UNFCC process is somewhat, if not largely, dysfunctional and, and to a large extent. Um, and, and so, y you know, un unless all the countries at the Security Council, the permanent members, actually thought that doing something by way of passing a resolution was, was really necessary. It, it isn't going to happen. But at, on the other hand, we do see countries, the example of self-interest is important. I mean, China has finally seen it's in its self-interest to do something about emissions. Their own people are choking and dying and getting sick, and they need to stop those coal emissions. So they are transforming. They're going to be the leader, I think, in, in green energy, and they are leading in many ways in, in getting into green energy. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's, that's why it's more a bottom-up approach, I think, is going to solve this thing. Although I'd like to think the United Nations could agree and say, this is going to be it, and that'll be it, but we don't have a world government now. Um, thank you very much, David. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on when you talk about climate justice on questions of diffuse responsibility and how the law might address some of those questions and then follow up on that, whether or not climate justice is in fact judiciable or it's something that like economic, social and cultural rights, the argument has made that it's, it's largely aspirational. Well, I think it's, it's largely aspirational, to answer the, last, the second part first, uh, because, it, but it, it's something that needs to be taken into account in how we carry on. So to the extent that the UN is identifying funding for things to be done, and there's a new Green Climate Fund, $10 billion committed so far by way of pledges, I think there's a great reason to be concerned about how those funds are going to be allocated and whether there's going to be climate injustice created through some of the, the work, the, the distribution of those funds. We're going to 
Are we going to see the same horrific human rights abuses by some of the projects that are going to be funded by that? But so it, it, is, insp it is aspirational, and, and, but it can be, there are processes where the aspirations can be inserted. They're not legal processes, but they're more funding processes. The World Bank, for example, and international development banks, they can all use criteria for what they will fund or won't fund. They can all say, we're going to want to know the implications of these projects before we fund them. And I think that's going to come down to the uh, national and international corporate community as well, and, and big banks. They're going to want to know, what are we funding? It's going to be like dirty property is now in Ontario or in North America. You know, 25 years ago, nobody thought about it. And then when it became clear that it was a potential liability, banks said, we're not lending on this stuff. And governments had to do something to to give uh, lenders some immunity, uh, it, it provided certain things were done. Well, I think the corporate community is going to come to the, so I think there's ways in which it can be also operationalized in, in the in uh, finance and international communities. Um, I, the first part of your question, I, can you elaborate? I didn't quite get it. Just on, on the question of, of um, diffuse responsibility, if there is a, a court proceeding and there's an assessment of responsibility, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone in this room, to some degree, is responsible for climate change. So how, how do we, how would a court address that question of who is, in fact, responsible for the remedy? Well, that raises a very interesting thought, which I, I've, uh, it reminds me. Um, you will hear all the big corporations in the United States, the oil, and oil industry in particular, or coal industry, saying, well, you know, we're all responsible. We're all responsible. You drive cars, we do this, you do that. We all, we're all responsible. So, uh, you know, we'll do something, you do something, and everybody have a nice time. Well, you know, that is not exactly the way things work. Uh, I mean, that, that's how they'd like to see it work, and that's the attitude that has to be overcome in, in looking at the situation. I mean, uh, sure, at the time, and for the last number of years, 100 years, nobody said putting emissions up there was a bad thing. But for the last 25 years, we've known it's a bad thing. And what have these companies done? Pretty well zip. Or like the tobacco companies deny that it's a problem, they say, we're not responsible, you're responsible. So I think their time is coming, and I don't think it's going to be seen to be our fault. It's going to be like the smokers in Quebec that said, well, you guys chose to smoke. Why should you be suing us? The court said, these companies knew they were putting out this product. So I think the same thing's gonna come back, and I think courts are gonna get it. Uh, thanks, David, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, like, number one is, um, Canadian government withdrawn the um, Kyoto Protocol for avoiding 14 billion dollars carbon credit like thing uh, like as um, environment minister uh, told that after returning from the uh, UN climate change um, summit so <coughs> uh, my question is uh, what uh, responsibility uh, what responsibilities Canadian government took after uh, like during these three years after like 2012, and is there any um, uh, future plan for taking the responsibilities for carbon emission? And then another uh, question is the second question is uh, uh, what IBA uh, whether IBA pressurized Canadian government to take responsibilities? Well, I mean. I think even Mr. Harper has begun to see that he's behind the curve, at least from, he says, we, we, we're going to do whatever the United States does. So he finally said we're going to come in with some regulations that deal with the power sector. But I mean, he's still much behind the curve. I mean, I think, you know, if you can get an NDP government, I'm from Alberta, I was born and educated in Alberta. If you can get an NDP government elected in Alberta, uh, anything can happen. Uh, so. I suspect that, uh, you know, and, and, and the oil industry in, in Calgary was packing the Palliser Hotel yesterday, the day before, saying, we want carbon pricing. They've been saying this behind the scenes for the last few years. They, they don't agree with Harper on this. 
but they were afraid to speak publicly. Now at least they're, they're able to come out with the NDP government coming in and they know that there's something going to happen. They can say, we want this. And it's going to happen. It's happening in Ontario. So there's going to be moves. And, and the, the sub-nationals, like the provinces are, and the states are getting active. And uh, you know about California, you know about Quebec and Ontario is joining in and there's going to be a big climate summit of the Americas this summer. CG is helping to uh, get involved in. And, and, and it's basically saying, you know, if the federal government in, in Canada and the United States are paralyzed from acting, we, the subnationals, can do something. In fact, we, the subnationals, have the jurisdiction. So that can happen, and we don't need to worry it's too much about the federal government. It would be nice to have them come along. And your second question about the IBA, well, I, I, I don't think the IBA is going to target any particular level of government, I mean, in national government. But we can still use the recommendations of the IBA report on, on the federal government and say, you guys should be doing more. Thank you. You touched on the idea that the oil patch has been in favor of carbon pricing for a long time, but they felt they had a political problem to, to deal with. Um, and I'm wondering, there, there's always been trouble sorting out, well, where did that come from? And would you attribute any of that to the concerns about kind of uh, it better to have a tax and then we don't have to worry so much about the the tort law from the kind of carbon majors approach do you think there's any you, do you know what i mean because yeah. now tell me the story why would the oil patch and and they've been again some of the research i'm involved with makes it clear that 50 dollars a ton does not they don't like it but does not scare them but still 50 dollars a ton is lot more than $25 a ton, why are they kind of interested in a, a carbon tax? Is there, is there a legal aspect that makes you say, well, I think I understand why they might prefer, prefer the tax approach? Well, Randy, I mean, we can only surmise unless we talk to these people, but um, I think it's part of the, they see the train coming down the track. And as you said, I think as you said, uh, you know, it, it better to be seen to be actually in favor of doing something than being the target in a subsequent carbon majors lawsuit, something like that. And because, by God, they're going to be at some point, there's going to be a lawsuit, I think, uh, at some point, whether it succeeds is a whole other thing, but not just the people, the 63 entities, 66 entities around the world, but, you know, I mean, the Canadian contributions are somewhat minor in the scheme of things, but still, they are an identifiable uh, emitters, and, and, some, and so, yeah, I think, I think they get it, and they also get it, I think, simply from a moral perspective and the ethical perspective, that they, they want to be seen as part of the solution, although obviously they need to be doing a hell of a lot more. Like BP, and, and, and as you know, in Shell, ten, eight or nine years ago, where particularly BP, had a big program to transform a lot of its stuff into green energy. And then after uh, something, something happened, and they're no longer on that page, but they, they need to be. Microphone. Thanks. Uh, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a law student, so um, oh, please I forgive. I have a good question in that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering about um, a couple of different aspects about um, your talk. Uh, the UNFCCC, um, any any sort of agreement that they would come up with that would be seen as binding. I guess I'm, I'm wondering about the question of enforcement. And also when you talk about uh, a carbon budget that would eventually be agreed upon, you talked about the four different components that are leading towards this idea of, of a, an international carbon cap. So again, it's that question of enforcement. How do you see that playing out? Well, that's a really good question. I mean. Uh and, and, and although some people talk about enforcement, they, you know, there's been nothing to enforce so far, so it's always been sort of a over there kind of question. Uh, it will certainly have to be um, more centrally addressed, and some people are thinking about it. I mean, in theory, I, I mean, international agreements and you, uh, uh, can, can be sort of enforced in, in different ways. M most of them are not too meaningful, but uh, there's some people in the room that could probably talk more about that than I could. Uh, but, but uh, you know, if, if can they be enforced in, in, say, the International Court of Justice? Well, uh, possibly. Uh, but, but even, 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 but the, the agreement would have to specifically say uh, 
you know, one party can take another to court, to the International Court of Justice, and, and if they sign on to this, uh, to this treaty or, or uh, agreement, then in theory they've so agreed to that jurisdiction. Nothing, sto nothing stops them from sort of withdrawing subsequently if they want to. So at an international level, you know, uh, it's, it's, there, it's very, uh, and I shouldn't step into international law enforcement too much here because we have some people who really know more about this than I do, but, but I think it's quite difficult. We, and one of the things we do in our report is look at that and say, you know, there's better places to enforce, for you really want to enforce, than the International uh, Court of Justice. You can have uh, some, like the Permanent Court of Arbitration has special rules about, about environmental matters. You could have a panel, or you could have an independent court for the environment. One of our recommendations is that there should be an independent court for, international court for the environment. And again, this would take political buy-in at an a, at a international level. It could start at a regional level. It could start with the coalition of the willing. And what you could do there, it wouldn't even necessarily have to give them absolute enforcement jurisdiction. You could have a tribunal that's expert, got expert people who actually understand what, you know, environment means and CO2 and biodiversity means and all the other nuances that you really have to understand. And you could go to them even for advisory opinions. It's not binding, but at least you'd have an expert tribunal, hopefully, you know, well-established former national judges, well-respected, who said, we've heard this. And, and they could allow anybody to come. You wouldn't. So right now, the international tribunals can only hear if both parties consent to be there. This would be a tribunal that could, let's say, have a citizens group come and say, Canada is not doing what it ought to do. Canada doesn't show up and respond. The court could say, we're appointing X lawyer as amicus curiae to represent Canada. If they don't want to be here, we're going to have a lawyer represent Canada. We'll hear what arguments Canada might make if they were here. Then we'll give an opinion. And, you know, this could uh, help, uh, I think, uh, move the goalposts a bit. I'm glad you, I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to think about the International Court. Thank you, David. I just want to, again, on a personal level, say a warm thank you to you for um, agreeing to do this and also um, agreeing to do this at this time because I know you have to catch a flight to Bonn later today. Sorry about that. <laughs> but thank you so much. Well, it was my pleasure. <laughs>